eternal torment, endless pain and devastating anguish. The concept of hell is thousands of years old, but does it really exist, and is there any evidence of its presence? Reported near-death experiences so often praise the divine and the realization of a greater beyond, however, some delve into the horrendous. What does it mean when a near-death experience is steeped in trauma? Have some people really been to hell and back? Today we dive into two stories that originate from the very depths of the underworld, and we ask ourselves, could hell really exist? Welcome to Mysteries Retold. Our first story comes from Gerald Johnson, a priest in Michigan. In February 2016, Gerald suffered a heart attack and claims he died and was sent to hell. The experience was one that would change his life forever, as he emphasizes that he would not wish the events on his worst enemy. Gerald states that after his heart attack, he was launched to the center of the earth, which is where he encountered demons, death, and eternal suffering. Gerald describes that his spirit left his physical body. Being a priest and having done so much good in his life, he felt as if he would be raised up to heaven. He was not, and was plunged to where he met indescribable horror. Gerald was met with heat, fire, and anguish. As he fell deeper into the flames, Gerald shares some of the horrors he witnessed. He saw a man walking on all fours like a dog. The man was being burned from head to toe, and his eyes were bulging out of his skull. He had huge chains around his neck which cut his skin. The man was crawling around on all fours like a hellhound in agony, as a demon took great pleasure in holding and pulling on the chain, continually tormenting the man. All around Gerald there were pits of death. Everything around him was decaying or dead. There was a stench in the air making almost every breath impossible to take. The fumes from the environment burnt his lungs. Just being there was unrelenting torment. A sense of isolation and hopelessness pervades hell, where individuals suffer not only physically, but spiritually and emotionally. The absence of light contributes to an overwhelming sense of darkness and despair. Hell is a place without reprieve, where the concept of time loses its conventional meaning, and the torment is unending. The air was thick with anguish, and the sounds of wailing, moaning, and gnashing of teeth created a haunting symphony of suffering. Gerald says telepathically, he knew the demon had been sent to the man's life to torment him from childhood through to his death. The demons know that if they can avert individuals from serving God, he will be able to overpower them in hell, and they will forever become his slave. There is also an area in hell where Gerald remembers hearing popular music echoing around. However, the songs were being endlessly repeated by demons. They were mocking those they were torturing with the music. Every word of every song was sung to torture and point at the individual's reluctance to praise God while they were on earth. Everything about his experience pushed mockery, pain and destruction onto Gerald. Gerald said he felt angry. Angry because he had committed his life to do good, but had still ended up being sent to hell. Eventually Gerald rose out of hell, returning to earth and speaking with God. Gerald explains that God told him that he had secretly been angry with the people that had harmed him during his life. He had wished punishment on them rather than forgiving. God went on to state that they are not Gerald's people to pass judgment on, and he needs to focus on his own tasks. Gerald returned to earth and our world. He has made a full recovery, but the experience still terrifies him. Gerald ends his story stating that, A man who cannot forgive is a man who forgot that he was forgiven. That is my experience from hell. It is a completely real place. A little bit of research quickly uncovers other stories that mirror Gerald's. It is interesting the similarities that are reported across multiple stories. Our next account comes from Brian Melvin, a man who described himself as a militant atheist, who technically died of cholera before being cast into hell. Brian says he remembers taking his final breaths in the world of the living, before being shot backwards through a dark void. The account that follows is truly remarkable. Brian contracted cholera through the consumption of contaminated water, left in a thermos at a local construction site where he was employed. The disease led him into a critical state of dehydration, ultimately proving to be terminal. During this critical phase, Brian was at home, lying in bed, and began experiencing wheezing gasps 
a manifestation of the severe impact of the ailment. Remarkably, he observed the surroundings with newfound clarity, even without the aid of his glasses. The ticking of the alarm clock marked the passage of time, with noon approaching and the entire experience taking on an unreal, surreal quality. Suddenly, there was a sensation of floating above his lifeless body. In this state, Brian became acutely aware of his own demise. Hovering above his lifeless body, Brian experienced pain associated with the effects of cholera. As he observed the room, he turned his attention upward, facing the textured drywall of the ceiling. A transition ensued, guiding him through the ceiling and into peaceful blackness. Amid this tranquility, he perceived mesmerizing humming and singing sounds. He was engrossed in their activity while slowly progressing toward an expanding speck of light. The pleasant darkness was eventually dispelled by a dazzling, brilliant light, exhibiting hues of colors previously unseen. This emanated from an individual standing on what appeared to be a massive rock suspended in the vastness of space. Draped in beautiful whitish robe-like garments, the figure sat on a chair carved from the rock. Brian descended below this being, who rose several steps to where he had landed. Overwhelmed, Brian wept and collapsed, only to be touched on the shoulder by an unseen presence, compelling him to stand. The celestial being proceeded to reveal Brian's life course, exposing his actions and leaving him without excuse. In this moment, Brian recognized that he was undergoing judgment, and acknowledged the deserving nature of his fate. Standing before the celestial being, whose hood concealed the face, Brian awaited his sentence, understanding that he could do nothing but receive the judgment that awaited him. Observing the being, Brian noticed severe trauma inflicted on the hands and feet of the figure. Deeply cut gnashes encircled the wrists, with the bones visibly exposed, indicating a significant burden had torn the joints apart. Despite the evident suffering, the celestial being remained stationary, evoking a sense of shame in Brian. Brian was looking at Jesus. The communication initiated by Jesus was all telepathic. He revealed an appointed time for Brian to embark on a journey to another land. Upon arrival he was instructed to articulate the being's name and title, promising revelations tied to God. Jesus continued to teach on the nature of death, emphasizing that returning was contingent on the will of the Father. He conveyed that some, including children, were raised for divine purposes, even when it wasn't their designated time to pass. Pointing towards a tunnel entrance to the left, Jesus informed Brian of his return path. Upon sighting the tunnel, Brian was lifted by a gentle force and floated towards it, feet first, now adorned in robe-like garments. Entering the tunnel, he was engulfed in a violently spinning vortex, hurtling towards a yellowish glint of light. Upon reaching it, Brian descended from its sky, landing with a thud on the ground. Surveying the unfamiliar surroundings, Brian witnessed a house on a hill, accompanied by unpleasant odors and strange sounds. People emerged from the house, approaching with joyous shouts of welcome. The disorienting experience left Brian questioning the nature of his location. Is it heaven or hell? Initially perceiving a paradise, the incongruity between the sounds and smells hinted at a different reality. An unsettling realization dawned as Brian observed the individuals in the unfamiliar surroundings. Something soon began to change as the people began to take on a translucent appearance. In that moment, their true nature became apparent. They were a collection of peculiar, foul creatures. Witnessing this disturbing revelation, Brian involuntarily uttered the words, Jesus Christ. A sense of terror gripped him as the stark reality of his surroundings became undeniable. Amidst the events, one of the creatures initiated communication, speaking to Brian in a heavy, unfamiliar accent. Instructing him to follow, Brian found himself compelled to comply with the creature's direction. The creature led him to the horizon's skyline, which seemed more akin to a painted mural than a natural horizon. Stretching out its landscape, the creature tore through the yellowish sky, creating a rift. With a beckoning gesture, it urged Brian to follow suit. Brian followed the ominous creature and found himself emerging on the other side of the horizon. The landscape unfolded as a vast, desolate expanse, featuring a wide, dirty, flat terrain that sloped downward, revealing an endless circular spiral of misery. Rows of cubes adorned the left side of the view, forming a wall of ten by ten foot partitions stacked high. Each cube, stacked six high, 
was enclosed by thin, smoke-tinted, gelatin-like walls. These cubes allowed visibility but prevented escape for the trapped individuals within. As Brian observed, each chamber housed an individual, ensnared and unable to escape. Glancing through the torn wall of the cube he had exited, Brian saw the haunting view of the house and tree within, seemingly beckoning him to return. Perplexed, he retreated for another glance at the cubicle, surprised by its apparent smallness despite appearing larger from the inside. In this surreal landscape, Brian encountered a lizard-like entity with ugly, greenish-yellow arms just a few feet away. The creature, resembling a fiend, reached out as if to drag him away to an ominous fate. Employing a boxer's defensive stance, Brian blocked the attempt, causing the fiend to step back, grinning from ear to ear. Hell contains a circular burial pit where the deceased are trapped within pit walls based on their deeds. Each individual resides in a symbolic chamber, restlessly experiencing recompense for their actions on Earth. Within each cube, various individuals caught the Brian's eye, experiencing a spectrum of emotions, ranging from boredom to anguish while being hideously tormented. Ghastly entities within these cubes wove illusions, presenting scenes from each trapped soul's life, complete with people, places, and things. As the journey progressed, Brian traversed between these cubes, exploring more chambers along the way. Brian recalls seeing Hitler in one of these cubes. It was not a Hitler of remorse. He had been driven even crazier. Within his cube, Hitler was being subjected to the trauma that every single victim under his ruling experienced. The creature in the forefront resumed its communication, employing foul language and curses as he navigated the despicable terrain. The creature then guided Brian through the haunting domain, revealing a large dusty plain or road extending from the cubicle walls. Ugly and beautiful beings roamed in loose packs on this plain, attempting to engage the observer in conversation throughout the duration of their stay. Overwhelmed by terror, Brian could only utter the words, Jesus Christ, incessantly. The ghastly creature led a hellish tour through the realm, descending to the lower levels of the spiral road and observing the events inside the cubes as they passed each lost soul. The harrowing journey was unbearable. Pain and suffering coursed through Brian. Brian was yearning to awaken but unable to do so. Each trapped soul faced the repercussions of their life choices in full measure. Many entered the pit and the cubes through spinning vortexes, with Brian noting the existence of another entrance. Isolated within their cubes, unaware of each other's presence, the trapped individuals solely perceived the creatures accompanying them, and the nightmarish scenes enacted within their personal square. In the observed realm, each individual ensnared experienced a peculiar sense of separation from God, akin to a banishment from the benevolent nature of God and true life. This profound awareness resonated within each person, acknowledging the deservedness of their fate as a consequence of choosing to distance themselves from God during their lives on earth. In a manifestation of divine justice, fairness, and unfathomable love, God granted them their desire, a place devoid of His presence, where each faced the consequences of their own actions. Upon entering their private abodes, many of these individuals initially fell prey to deception, believing they had arrived in a paradise. However, as eternity unfolded, the true nature of their surroundings became apparent. Some experienced immediate anguish, unveiling the reality of their existence in a place characterized by doom, despair, and unending nightmares. A notable instance of distress occurred when the beastly guide attempted to confine Brian within a unique cubicle. In the midst of his terror, Brian's rescue transpired as he cried out the words, Jesus Christ. The arrival of someone behind him, lifting him up, with a profound sensation of love, mercy, authority, power, justice, and righteousness. The overwhelming emotions rendered the repetition of those previously ceaseless words unnecessary as Brian turned his head into the cleft of the being's shoulder, shedding tears against the white garb. As Brian wept, the Redeemer bore him back to the cube of arrival, navigating through the vortex back to the colossal rock. Placing Brian's feet on the rock, the Redeemer granted a glimpse of heaven and conveyed a crucial message. None could enter heaven without passing through the gate. Numerous revelations unfolded on that rock. Subsequently, the time to depart and return arrived. Brian floated back along the path of his journey, 
soon finding himself in the room above his lifeless body, observing the scene below. Gliding back into his body, he awoke abruptly, struggling to regain breath until assisted by someone hitting him on the back. Subsequent hospitalization was necessary for further treatment and recovery. The near-death experience lasted approximately four hours, marked by Brian's awareness of the time when leaving his body at 11.50 a.m. and the return close to 4 p.m. Lingering health effects, such as a clicking sound in his heart, short-term memory issues, and initial speech impairment persist. However, with the passage of time, speech has normalized. The stories we hear of near-death experiences are so often positive experiences, steeped in heavenly encounters, but what sense can we make of the opposite? The accounts shared of individuals seemingly journeying through hell carry remarkable similarities between accounts. Unsurprisingly, all describe a place too despicable and terrifying to imagine. Science tries to provide answers to these great near-death mysteries, and for all the questions science can answer, there are many it cannot. What do the accounts of journeys into hell signify, and could hell really be a place looming for some of us? Thank you for watching today's Mysteries Retold. Please do like and subscribe if you are enjoying the content, and we will see you again very soon for another terrifying mystery. Remember folks, live a good life before it's too late to turn back. Good night.